Okay, so let's get started then. So thank you again for this invitation. So today we're going to talk about writing assessment and we'll try to see how ChatGPT and artificial intelligence more generally can help us in this regard. So let's get started. So exams are very high stakes for students. Students may fail or they may get lower grade or GPA. They may deny their visa or you know, immig uh, immigration request. And so for many teachers, they might, you know, a teacher might get the impression that their primary role is to actually teach in the classroom while assessment might be more like an afterthought, you know, when to the exam, I will, you know, um, mark my students. But in reality, exams, at least in the current formal educational system, I can make or break a student. And what's called rater variability is related to the characteristics of raters and not the performance of students. So it's unfair that the grade of the students might change, not because of the student's performance being higher or lower, but because of you know something you know in the raters themselves. So um see next. So what is rater variability? You know, raters may vary depending on the degree to which they comply with the, the scoring rubric. They may you may have a rubric and you may comply with it and you may comply with it partially and you may not comply with it. This can be a source of variability among raters. Raters may also vary based on how they interpret um, the rating criteria. Different raters may have different interpretations. Raters may also vary in the severity of how they interpret and apply their um, these criteria, some people are more strict than others. Variability also may differ based on the understanding of the rating scale overall, and we will see some examples, you know, a bit later. And raters may also disagree on the ratings, uh, it's consistency across examinees and score uh, scoring criteria and performance tasks. Also, we will see some examples in the next slide. So this is just a general overview. So in one study, the researchers asked raters on what, you know, this presentation applies to writing as well as speaking, but we will focus primarily on writing. So many, but many of the points will also apply to speaking assessment also. So in this, in one study, the researchers asked um, teachers to indicate on what basis do they evaluate their students' um, essays. So tell us why. Some people said the length of the essay is very no, important. What's the word? I think it's instead of basically over here. Um, and the length, some people would measure it by the number of words, some people the number of lines, some people just a quick, a quick glance. Some people focus on legitimacy, especially when doing handwriting. So they assess legitimacy also. Some people focus on grammar. They say grammar is important. If you have certain types of mistakes and certain frequency of these mistakes, then these mistakes matter in their assessment. Some people pointed out that structure is important and this structure can be at the sentence level or paragraph level or the narrative level. Some people say, well, I focus on communicative effectiveness. If I can understand the message that the student is trying to convey, I will give you know, some points also. Some people focus on the tone. 
whether it's natural and whether it, you know it seems you know uh, native speaker like for example or not some people focus on vocabulary whether it's about the accuracy in the word choice or the variety of the word choice versus being repetitive some people will say spelling and whether there is frequent spelling mistakes and whether you know it's the mistakes are in the difficult words only or across the board some people said content you see there are a lot of things that teachers think about when they mark essays is the content interesting or is it you know dull task realization and this is kind of tricky did the student really answer and fulfill the task required or not the focus on punctuation and whether it follows standard writing especially academic writing or not and teachers weigh each of these elements differently and they may vary widely and this is how inconsistent you know their ratings can be because wide disagreement about the even the weight you know some teachers may say yeah vocabulary is important and spelling is important but one teacher may you know weigh vocabulary differently than uh, than a different person writing the same essay so let's have more specific examples of rater biases i'm going to ask you whether you you have this bias or you have heard or seen somebody a colleague or a former teacher who has manifestations of these biases so strictness biases so some people have a, a chronic tendency to be strict when they mark do you think you are you know you can chat you can put your answer in the chat while i'm talking do you think you are strict or have you come across somebody who has a, a bias it's always being consistently harsh on students some people are the opposite they kind of being more lenient and easygoing even though they are using the same rubrics there are people who have a more like it's a central tendency bias they say i i don't give the full mark just you know forget the full mark i may give you say nine out of ten that's that's the maximum okay or i will not going to give you very very low mark i will give you somewhere in the middle so some people have this this bias also some people have a restriction of range bias where they say okay my students will get say between six and eight or nine for example that's my range i rarely ever give any lower or any higher than that even though the student might deserve it so this is an ex another bias the halo effect bias so if somebody has a good command of one aspect say grammar you tend to say, oh, you mark them also highly on other aspects. So these other aspects might deserve lower marks. The Horns effect bias is the opposite. So let's say you focus too much on grammar. And then if the grammar command of the student is not that great, you tend to lower their scores on other aspects also even though they might deserve better in those other aspects. Contrast effect bias. And, and this is, you know, this is very common. You usually, you don't have one essay to mark and that's it. You usually have a bunch of at least 30, 40, 50, even you know, 100 essays. And then if you are marking students, you know, four or five students in a row that are very good. Then you have one poor student, you say, well, you know, you are very poor. Then you might penalize them just because the ones before that happened to be before them are very good or the opposite. So the order can make an effect also on you as a teacher. First impression bias. So you are marking the essay and you read the introduction it's what a great introduction 
So because of it's a great introduction, you tend to also mark that student, you know, highly on other aspects, even though in some other aspects they may um, not perform as well, as good. Or the opposite, the introduction is very poor, so you just feel <laughs> upset and just mark them down everywhere. Recency bias, or maybe the opposite, the conclusion is great. So you say, wow, it's such a great essay because the conclusion was so good. Then you forget the introduction, you forget, you forget the body, you forget different things. Or, you know, as I said, this also applies to speaking. You know, if the last question in the speaking exam that the student answered was, you know, a good answer, then you forget the other parts of, of their performance. Cultural, fam <laughs> cultural familiarity bias. So if you are familiar with the, the participants' backgrounds, then you might, you know, mark them differently. It might be um, in their favor. It might not be in their favor. It might be, you know, somebody coming from a different culture. You say, wow, that's interesting. So you mark them differently, maybe better. Or if you are unfamiliar with them, you are unfamiliar with their backgrounds, so you might penalize them. The acquaintanceship bias. So maybe this is very common. Uh, I'm sure that you know, if the, in the comments, if you experience this, you can say so. The acquaintanceship bias. If you know the the individual, you may tend to give them an un, you know, um, biased treatment. You may say, for example, oh, this student has developed a lot. I know that this student, you know, at the beginning of the semester, they were di at this stage. And now look at this essay now that they produced. So you tend to take that into account as you mark the essay, while in fact, in this case, your job is to look at the performance on the essay itself. Or it may be the opposite. You may have a student who is um, a very good student, for example, and they write not so great an essay. You say, I know the student's level, so I'm going to give them extra marks because I know the student. But the other students that you, you don't know, you are not going to give them these extra marks. So is this going to be fair? Similar to me bias, sometimes if if they give a story or write something that you experience something like it, you enjoy it, and maybe you give them some extra points. Or the opposite, if you think that what they wrote is interesting and dissimilar to you, then you might mark them highly on irrelevant aspects like grammar or something that's not relevant to being similar to you. Personal bias, some people will just have Personal biases like regarding, you know, ethnicity or gender or class or age or social status, the list is very long, you know, people will have these biases as part of their development. So the list is very long, I'm still going to continue, but you can see the risks that are involved when you mark an essay or evaluate a speaking in a speaking test, all these biases come into play. Sympathy bias, and maybe this is common also. You know the student, they are failing the course, they need a specific mark, and you say, oh, if I don't get this, I will fail the course, and if I, if I fail the course, my, I will get the third warning, and they will you know, term, expel me from the school or whatever, and you say, oh, I know your essay is not that good, but, you know, sympathy bias. Current state of mind bias. So you didn't have your coffee that morning. You don't feel in a good mood. So your students may not get, you will get a different treatment when you mark their essay before your coffee compared with after your coffee. Or if you are running, you know, you have to submit by a strict deadline and you are marking late at night, then your marking might be different compared with, you know, in normal circumstances.
So wh why are these variability? So there is the cognitive load. When, when you, you have loads of essays to mark, you know, there is only so much that you can think about, you know, in the, in the working memory that you can process. So there is a lot going on. Also, there are different criteria as we will see next about marking. So you need to juggle many things about grammar, about vocabulary, about this, about that for every single essay you are marking in a row. So this can be very demanding. You might be multitasking. It's not uncommon for teachers to have some admin roles that they are involved in. They might be teaching also full time while they are marking. Um, they might be marking different exams at the same time. Also, they have so uh, they may have, you know, at the end of the day, they are people, you know, they have family life. So all these factors also come to play while you are marking. Monitoring pressure, if you know you are monitored and somebody is going to look at your marking and it might go into your annual evaluation and this might result in your contract being renewed or not renewed and this pressure also can have an effect on your own rate of variability. And of course, if there is an upcoming deadline, you want to finish quickly, 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 then this will also affect um, um, the accuracy of marking, the consistency of marking. Also, if you have a large number of students, then this will also have an impact. So let's have a look at this quote. Writer training, you know, let's say, let's train writers, you know, address this problem, problem solved, let's just train them. Writer training has been shown to be much less effective at reducing writer variability than expected. That is, writers typically remained far from functioning interchangeably, even after extensive training. How disappointing. Or after individualized feedback on their ratings. How disappointing. You, you know, if you have extensive training, this still doesn't guarantee writer consistency, let alone, as is commonly practiced in many institutions, you have a quick norming session just before marking. Let's get quickly in a room and just, you know, have one or two sample essays, you know, and you mark it and you mark it. You know, this will say, this person will say seven out of 10. This person will say seven out and a half out of 10. Say, oh, the consistency is, is okay. So you're good to go. And that doesn't really help. That only to check boxes for accreditation purposes. We say we have this practice, but whether this practice is effective or not, Maybe not. So let's look at marking rubrics. There are two types of marking rubrics. There is the holistic rubric, and then there is the analytic rubric. We'll see it in a minute. So this is an example, just a, a toy example to illustrate what a, a holistic rubric is from Gonzalez 2014. So let's imagine, as I said, just a toy example, that you are evaluating service breakfast in bed. And you have this simple rubric. Let's have a look at this rubric. The highest score is four. All food is perfect, perfectly cooked. Presentation surpasses expectations. The recipient is kept exceptionally comfortable throughout the meal. So if your evaluation of this service is applies here, then you give the service four out of four. If the food is cooked, correctly, but not perfectly. The meal is presented in a clean and well-organized manner, but does not surpass expectations. And the recipient is kept comfortable, not exceptionally comfortable, but still comf comfortable throughout the meal, then the service will deserve three out of four. Some food is cooked poorly. So some, not all, but some food is cooked poorly. Some aspect, again, some, not all, of the presentation of presentation is sloppy or unclean, or the recipient is uncomfortable at times. So this is two. And the lowest mark, most of the food is cooked poorly, the presentation is sloppy or unclean, and the recipient is uncomfortable most of the time. So, so it looks easy, 
you know, you evaluate your experience and then you just pick one, two, three, or four. This is simple. And this is the holistic rubric. Let's look at the analytic rubric now. It will be the same task, pretty much the same thing you are doing, but in an analytic rubric format. So let's look at it. There is food, presentation, and comfort. These are separate categories. And then there is one to four. This is one to four here. So let me just change this to food. This is food. Presentation. So this is presentation. And comfort. You know, this is comfort. So food, most food is, is cold. Let, let's, let's look at the, the good part first, you know. <laughs> All food is perfectly cooked and seasoned at the eater's preference, you know, whatever is, is offered. So this applies here. It's pretty much the same. It's more detailed, but it is food. You, you write the food separately. Then number three, all food is at the correct temperature. Some food is colder. Most food is colder or warmer, etc., etc. Again, you write presentation. So here, let's say you put it, you know, let's say four, an example. And here for this example, let's say you picked three. Presentation, food is served on a clean tray, food is served on a clean tray with napkin software, some decorative tray or now silver may be there to missing. Some uh, more than one item, are there to missing? Let's say for some reason you said I'm going to give you three here. Comfort, you know, you have recipient is walking gently and lovingly. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> recipient is walking gently, assisted in seating adjustment <laughs> and given reasonable time and space to eat. Wake up is somewhat abrupt. Recipient may struggle, may struggle to eat <laughs> with seat adjustment, or there may be some rushing or crowding during eating. <laughs> Wake up is abrupt. I'm not going to read this. That's it. Let's say you say, ah, I don't like this. Maybe you know, give it, or I like it. I'm giving it more. So the the marking here is more nuisance. There's more detailed in an analytic rubric. But at the same time, it takes more time. If you have dozens and dozens and dozens of um, essays to mark, if you just if your task is just to give three or to just to give two or to give four, it's very simple. You know, just get, pick the number and that's it. But if you are going to give more details, then this is more time consuming. So this might work if there is no students are going to ask you for feedback. But here, if the students are going to ask you for feedback and students usually do and they get, especially if they get a lower mark, so you can at least point them to why they get a lower mark. And again, but there's a different question now, are students really going to go through all these descriptions and understand what's meant by them or not? It's, you know, maybe not. Let's let's have let's look at the TOEFL writing rubric. So the TOEFL has um, let's go back to this has a, a um, believe it or not a holistic rubric starting from zero all the way to five, and that's it. So if we look closer, a the full mark would be a fully successful response. Uh, a typical response displays the following relevant and well elaborated explanations, you know, effective use of variety of syntactic structures, almost no lexical or grammatical errors. So in this case, the student or the, the candidate will get five, which is the top mark. A generally successful, you know, not fully successful, a generally successful will include the relevant and adequately elaborated, not well elaborated explanations. This can be a bit vague for many people. I, you can imagine how, much, how people will disagree with when it comes here. A variety of, instructor, of syntactic structures, but not effective use of a variety of syntactic structures and few lexical or grammatical errors. 
A partially successful response here, elaboration with the explanation, et etc. Et sometimes unclear or missing. So we start to get some problem. Uh, some variety, some noticeable lexical and grammatical errors. So, and then you go down, you know, it gets worse and worse until you get zero. So this is the TOEFL um, marking rubric. Let's look at the IELTS marking rubric. It follows an analytic marking rubric. You have, you know, the, the highest mark is nine and you have task achievement. You have coherence and cohesion. You have lexical resource and you have grammatical range and accuracy. And then it goes down to eight to seven and it goes to six and to five all the way down to, to um, one or zero. So all requirements of the task has fully achieved. The response covers all requirements, task relevant is sufficiently. There's not covered the requirements, but not all of them not fully, not appropriately. The response focuses on the requirements and appropriate format. Generally addresses the requirements of the task, maybe inappropriate in places. So when we reach five, it's kind of problems appear. So six and above are, you know, okay. So coherence, the message can be followed effortlessly or the message can be followed with ease, kind of. Is it really that different? Information and ideas are logically organized. There is clear progression throughout. A few lapses may occur. So problems start to appear at seven for coherence. Information are generally arranged coherently. There is a clear overall progression and uh, organization is evident, but not wholly logic, et cetera, et cetera. So lexical resource, full flexibility, a wide resource, but not full, okay. The resource is sufficient, but not wide, so, but sufficient. The resource is generally adequate, so it's kind of less and less. The resource is limited, but minimally adequate. So, and then it goes down and down. Finally, grammar, a wide range of structures, a wide uh, scope to use of full flexibility, a wide range of structures within the scope of the task is flexibly, but not full flexibility. A wide variety of complex structures is used with some flexibility. You can see the, you know, it's going down a bit. And a mix of simple and complex sentences and range of structures is limited. Okay, so um, we see that it's kind of sometimes vague. Um, you have different types of rubrics. So how can ChatGPT address this? So I had some sample essays for demonstration purposes. I input them into ChatGPT and I just gave it this prompt. Write the following essay based on the four IELTS band descriptors out of nine each. And that's it. I didn't explain these band descriptors as that which I showed in the previous slide. ChatGPT already knows these um, descriptors, which are Anyway, task response, coherence and cohesion, lexical resource, and grammatical range. Now let's compare your rating of chat GPT, uh, of the, I'm going to show, show an essay in the next slide, and chat GPT's rating. So I'm going, we are going to have a quick look at one sample essay. I'm going to ask you to write this essay out of nine. I'm going to show a poll and then in the following slide, I'm going to show what ChatGPT said about that essay so that we compare your ratings with ChatGPT's ratings. So here is a sample essay from IELTSblog.com. So the question is, many countries, in many countries, children are engaged in different kinds of page work. Some people regard this as completely wrong, while others consider it a valuable work experience. Uh, important for learning and taking responsibility. What is your opinion? And we have a, um, a four paragraph um, essay here. Just to quickly, the issue of whether or not children should be engaged in some paid work has sparked a heated debate, while some argue that having some employment experience is conducive to a child's learning and development. I contend that it would be it would be it would bring harm to the child's health and learning. So I'm going to launch a poll now. And I assume you can see the poll here. It should appear in your screen now. So I would like you to 
quickly look at this essay and evaluate it overall. So as you evaluate it, I'm going to quickly glance through it. First of all, a workplace designed for adults is normally shortage of child-friendly facilities. Desks and chairs are too high for a child. The light switches are installed on the walls and unreachable for, by children. Interesting. Also, emergency training facilities such as phones are only provided to adults. Furthermore, various hazards such as polluted air and chemical fumes are still produced in factories and farms. Undoubtedly, young people would suffer in such workplaces. So it seems that most people are seven. So let's wait for the others also. So children would, would find it frustrating when they are not properly in inducted before starting a job. A child working in, in a cement factory would, would feel a setback when he could not get immediate support while struggling with procedures of recording different raw materials and is required by the job that is required by the job furthermore without sufficient support a child's misunderstanding or inappropriately communicating with others would only disappoint him and prevent him from active learning and interacting with others so let's look at the poll so 88 44 uh, percent is changing saying you know more or less I'm going to change this. So 43% are saying, um, now again, nine is the highest grade. In IELTS, it can go lower, but we are not going to go lower in this example. You know, let's just evaluate it between five and nine. So the majority is kind of, okay, so eight is kind of reaching to, to um, it's kind of catching up. Eight is catching up. Very few people marked it as five. So, so there is some race between seven and eight. Okay, so it's kind of, let's go, let's see what Chad GPT said now. So it's kind of almost clear that seven is the winner followed closely by eight. Let's look at what ChatGPT said. Interesting, task response is actually six out of nine. That's so disappointing. Coherence and cohesion, actually six out of nine. Looks like a resource, five, that was strict. ChatGPT is very strict here. Grammatical range and accuracy in six out of nine. Very low relative to what most of the audience in this presentation thought. That's interesting. So you may think it's fair. <laughs> this is what ChatGPT says. Okay, so I'm going to end this poll and go, let's have another example. Maybe it's strict here. Let's go to another example. So here is another example. Have a look at it. I will prepare the poll. I will launch this poll. So the poll should have appeared now in your screens. So this, uh, in some countries, private cars are now banned from certain city centers. What are the advantages and disadvantages of such a system? And do you feel that this is something that most cities should adopt? Let's have a look, just let's have a quick glance. Banning car cars from city centers is a recent trend and it can be seen in various cities around the world, certain advantages and disadvantages immediately spring to mind when considering the step that city councils are taking. It's kind of British like you know, city councils. The advantages are clear. Let's look at the results. So it's still seven, you know, most people are leaning seven. So it's kind of central tendency. I'm, I'm seeing central tendency here now. I wonder if, if I put all the way to zero, what would happen? The, uh, some cars were introduced, since cars were introduced, city centers have always been areas where air quality is poor due to the amount of emissions in which, which in turn affects people's health. City centers become quieter and safer for people to wander around shopping and enjoying themselves. Access to city centers can still be good and as it is usually only private vehicles are banned. Buses and taxis can still take people in and out of city center, 
uh, city center areas, many towns also operate park and ride schemes. So people leave their cars in safe car parks in the outskirts of town and travel with a dedicated bus service in towns to the town centers. It would seem hard to criticize this kind of scheme. Let's look at the results so far. So it's kind of 47% saying seven. Uh, eight is shyly trying to catch up. 27, 26, 8. Some people still 5 and 6. A few people say 9. Okay, so let's look at what Chad GPT says about this essay. Task response, 7 out of 9. Sorry, Dr. Ali. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up soon. Factor, uh, sorry, Dr. Ali. Uh, uh, what is that's fine. That's fine. I just want to remind you. Uh, we uh, yeah. we have questions and answers. So yes, thank you. Okay. So, much. so it's kind of more consistent now. Coherence and cohesion. Seven out of ten. Ten, which is in line with what the participants said. Lexical resource. Seven. Grammatical range and accuracy. Eight. So it's kind of more consistent with with what you uh, in the audience said. Okay, so let's let's see the next. So here is the final essay. I'm going to finish up now. Let's launch the next essay, the next um, poll. Let's read the question together. Having a salaried job is better than being self-employed. To what extent do you agree or disagree with this statement? Okay, so about jobs now. If one wants to work for money, there are really only two options, working for someone else for a salary and being self-employed. Most people involved with these two options and they both have advantages and disadvantages. Okay, interesting introduction, kind of short. Being self-employed means that the worker owns the business that is being done. This might be a small one-person business or a large company with hundreds of employees. The first advantage of this is the capacity to earn more money. Let's look at the results. So it's kind of eight now, seven and eight. So eight is catching up to seven more quickly this time. So it's the, they are equal now, 30%. So let's give the audience a chance to, to evaluate it. If the business does very well, the income can be considerable and the owner of the company will receive the benefits. On the other hand, if business is not good, the owner's income will be low. Self-employed people also have the benefit to some extent of choosing their working hours and holidays and they have the right to change anything within their business. With, the, with this autonomy, however, comes the pressure to succeed and reliance on one's employees if there are any to do their best to make business the business thrive. So most people are tending to, again, I can't see a central tendency bias here. I'm not sure if this is a bias or or what, because most people are saying, um, although in theory, these come from different bands of, of uh, according to the IS descriptors. So these should be in theory be evaluated differently. So, um, Let's read one or two more sentences to give, to give people the chance to finish writing. Salaried workers do not experience the same stress as self-employed workers of companies. They might have stress in their duties, but the pressure that comes with keeping one's business operating success, successfully in order to support one's, oneself and one's family is just not felt by the employee. So 44% say seven, 27% say eight. Few people say five, six, and nine. So seven is, is the winner here. I will end the poll and let's go and see before I end the poll. Let's go and see what ChatGPT says. Task response is eight, actually. ChatGPT liked this essay, wasn't expecting this. Coherence and cohesion, seven. Lexical resource, seven. And grammar is eight which is kind of the highest essay that um, it gave. So kind of ChatGPT is more generous than you in, for this essay. So you can see that uh, 
you can interpret this very differently, but anyway, um, yeah, 7.5. Okay, let's take 0.7.5. So, um, so ChatGPT cannot, I emphasize, ChatGPT cannot at least currently replace uh, human writers because sometimes when you read the description, it's not clear what, why, you know, sometimes the explanation doesn't make sense. So it can be frustrating for students. It might help students to um, learn. It might help teachers to reflect as an exercise, but at least in its current state, it's not that reliable. If you regenerate the response, it kind of gives you slightly different answers every time. So a seven might be an eight, an eight might be a seven. There will be some discrepancy, but it's slight. So even JetGPT itself can vary if you regenerate um, the response. So, um, uh, just final thoughts. So, JetGPT evaluation might, might vary slightly if regenerated. Explanation are sometimes unclear, not <clears throat> relevant, and uh, it might help trainers, as I said, to reflect. So, um, these are the references. If you would like to to look at it, let me end this poll. And thank you for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions. Thank, thank you so much. much. Um, I just want to remind the participants that now we have a break until 6.30, but we can uh, be taking questions for Dr. Ali before the next speaker arrives. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, Ali, I, uh, for your remarkable presentation. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Hello. Can I uh, just chip in with a question? Is that right? Sure. Yeah? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, thank Shoot. you very much. Uh, my name is Khalid and uh, Khalid Libyari, and I'm uh, uh, sort of, uh, I'm working at the University of York uh, in the UK. So it's, uh, thank you for the interesting uh, presentation from Dr. Ali. And I just wanted to say uh, and share sort of uh, research that I've been doing with a colleague of mine about ChatGPT, and maybe this is not the right forum to kind of share that, but would like to extend that after uh, the symposium and get in touch with Dr. Ali. At the moment, uh, I would like to echo what you said about ChatGPT being unreliable at the moment. I've done research on Grammarly, Criterion, uh, produced by ETS and stuff, which is interesting really, but at the surface level, I can say that AI can be helpful and supplementary to uh, uh, sort of providing scoring, providing feedback and stuff, but not at the, the content and organization level. So ChatGPT is kind of like, everyone is talking about it, website, blogs and everything, but it is uh, still limited. So in terms of reliability, it's, a, it's very unreliable. And I would like uh, to thank Dr. Ali again for, for this and ask uh, a question. How would you envisage the use of ChatGPT, Dr. Ali, uh, in the future inside classrooms, uh, uh, whether sort of uh, pre-university or university where we teach EFL or EFP? Okay, thank you for this comment. Yeah, this area is fertile for research. Researchers are interested. And I expect an avalanche of research into this is going to happen in, in the coming years. But at the same time, AI is going to also improve, you know, maybe day by day, and it's an arms race. So in the far future, there is a possibility that AI is going to be so accurate and replace human markers because at the end of the day marking is more like a mono monotonous task that many teachers complain about and they would be happy just to get rid of this additional burden to them so if the if the uh, you see also the biases that i discussed in, discussed in the first part of this presentation is also a major problem so if ai becomes reliable and consistent <laughs> then this might be an added advantage to the educational process.
Well, we would like at some point, uh, we've already presented uh, sort of uh, our results in, in Thailand last week, and we would like to share our results, myself and uh, Dr. Shabara from uh, uh, Hartford Church Hartford University Church. with you, yes, in in the future and see what sort of results you got, what sort of results, because we've been working on ChatGPT in terms of how it can be used in uh, testing in general, how reliable it is. And thank you for saying generating and regenerating because we, our results confirm uh, the unreliability. There's no correlation whatsoever between first generation, second generation of uh, scoring. So probably we'll be in touch or over email and share some results with you, Dr. Ori. Thank you. Great. Looking forward to looking more closely at your results. We have, thank you so much for your questions. You. Um, um, we have Dink's question from Dr. Mansour, how to ensure cohesion and, co and coherence in writing a composition? Um, that's more like a, um, a teaching question. So coherence and cohesion, you know, linking words and linking ideas. So um, there is, you know, we can learn about it in a different place. So we are here talking about the assessment itself. Okay, and then we have next uh, from uh, Masum, um, uh, who has uh, thanked you for your um, presentation. Also, is asking human bias and awakening marks division uh, deviation will not happen in terms of evaluating writing of the candidates if we use ChatGPT. If many teachers continue using it, how they will acquire the skills of evaluating scripts? Scripts. Do you think students should use ChatGPT to develop their work writing skills? Yeah, this is a very convenient tool for students and teachers to practice on. It's very convenient. You just put in your essay and give it the prompt, say evaluate it based on IELTS, and that's it. You don't you don't need to know the descriptors that IELTS uses. It knows these descriptors. And uh, it will give you a response. The response might not be, you know, at this stage, uh, very accurate and reliable, but it will help you reflect. You can ask it back and forth. You say, why did you give me this score in coherence, for example? And it will explain to you, give you some ideas, give you some, uh, some reasons and ideas to improve. So you can think about this. So... So even if it is not very reliable at this stage, that doesn't mean it is completely useless. It at least will help you reflect and practice. Okay. Thank you very much. And we have next, there are many instances where the grades are revised after an appeal. In this situation, is it possible to rely on AI for uh, marking an essay? Yeah, so Probably. yeah, yeah, there are it, it humans it, to err is a human, to err is AI also. So AI does err at the end of the day, it's, it's not just humans. And people's appeals might be you know true, and students might deserve higher marks. I don't imagine that students will ask, you know, it's <laughs> my mark is too high, lower me. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are so many biases. And at the end of the day, we train AI ourselves. And as long as it's learning from us, it might also be learning our own biases. So we need to fix this also. We need to train it. We need to keep train it, training it. So maybe one day we might have an AI tool dedicated and well-trained just for marking essays, not just a general chat GPT or other you know, tool, just one tool dedicated for marking. And that might be a viable way forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have the uh, floor open to Q&A. Please go ahead and ask us any, uh, ask uh, Dr. Ali Huri, any questions that you may have, and we have the coffee break, so um, uh, we still have a few minutes if uh, Dr. Ali Huri has time to um, stay around.
Uh, I see there is a hand yeah. raised. There's a hand raised by uh, Wahid, I guess. Can you see? You can ask a question if you if you have a question, please. Don't have to wait. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank, uh, thank you so much. Uh, ma'am, uh, I have a question. Uh, I am Arshad Abbas from uh, Pakistan. So I am the student of uh, last year, like at graduation, and I am also working on thesis. So totally here, uh, discuss about the chat GPT. So ma'am, uh, uh, can I use the chat GPT for thesis? Yeah, this is outside the scope of this presentation, but generally speaking, there are concerns about uh, AI generated text if you don't own it and you, you know, you could generate something that could be hallucinating and then you copy paste it into your thesis, which is absolutely wrong. You can ask it to brainstorm ideas, you can have a chat with it, you can ask it questions, you can learn from it, but you shouldn't really just input a prompt and then copy paste whatever it gives you and put it in your thesis or anywhere really. Okay, sir, thank you so much. Thank you, and we have Firuz, how are you? Good seeing you here. Yes, Wahid. Firuz, you're muted. Yes. Um, am I audible? Yes, Feroz. Hi. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Actually, I wanted I wanted to take this opportunity to you know convey my warm regards all the way from China, from Far East, to Dr. Ali Al Huri because we met in Dubai to Saudi Arabia this this year. So it's been quite a long time, and now I'm back back to the conferences. So I just joined, and it's just. 11 30 p.m so it's quite late time but i just joined and i'm i'm so happy i'll be i'll be around and thank you very much i'll try to catch up with the email and the ppts in case they send us that would be nice but other than that i wish i wish all the best to the conference and thank you to dr huri from china thank you, <laughs> yeah. thank you for coming to the talk uh next we have uh, wahid I think we have, Wahid asked, just asked a question. Wahid Hamid, yes. We can't hear you. Who do you are from Honduras? Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Well, I may extend uh, another question to uh, Dr. Ali, if, if that's okay, since we have time. Uh, uh, it's the question of that you just raised in 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 relation to the question from uh, the PhD student from Pakistan. Uh, we're all aware that universities have been kind of up in arms about assessment and the future of assessment since ChatGPT can be generating text and stuff. But my question uh, to you: How do you kind of see the future of uh, sort of our programs, assessment, especially those that are rely on assignment writing. Uh, if, as an example, I'm leading one of uh, the MA TESOL programs at the University of York, and we've been thinking about it much, whether students will be using sort of uh, chat GPT and similar AI tools to write their assignments. We're aware that there would be ethical reasons and we'll be kind of training them on academic integrity and stuff. But how how do you see uh, the way out, if you like, in terms of these programs relying mainly on assignment based assessment? So, yeah, as I said uh, previously, that marking whether it's an assignment and under a postgraduate assignment or a student essay a one-page essay, marking is still a burden. And with this cognitive load, with this you know, fatigue, with all other biases. So one way to address this is that the marker themselves can feed this essay. There are some ethical concerns, I know, So, but these concerns can be addressed also into the uh, chat GPT or any other tool. And instead of asking it to evaluate, 
you can also feed your own evaluation into it and say, give me your opinion about my evaluation. What do you think of my evaluation? So the chat GPT will give you a response, say, yeah, you were strict in terms of cohesion and coherence. And you say, why? Convince me. And then you go back and forth in conversation with, with the tool. And then it might say, your grammar, you are lenient. You say, why? It's good grammar. Give me an example of grammar mistakes. And then you go back and forth with them. So it's a learning experience. Students can also do the same thing before they submit their assignments. There is no reason why they shouldn't reflect. They can submit their assignment into ChatGPT. They can get feedback. They uh, can thank improve. you so much. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we have our next session.